you know, I just want to uh, say thank you for the feedback. Feedback's critical, and it's important. And I also want to say thank you for respecting each other. Uh, I think it's important as adults that we model the type of behavior that we want our kids to learn. And sometimes we can agree to disagree, and that's okay, because that's really what happens in life. Uh, but we got to find some common ground. And that's kind of part of what this is. And, and so we have been trying to look at listening to some of the feedback that you've given as a district, talking really for the last three years about, okay, here's where we're at because of you, a community who supported 2016 bond, who had a vision to take the risk to say, we believe in our kids enough to say, we're going to invest in them, okay? We want the best for them, and we believe as a community we can provide that, and I think you are the ones who delivered that. So thank you for that. Second, what can we do to continue to build upon the things that we've already started? And you've heard as a group and as a committee some things that we've done where we just didn't start at the top. We've really been focused on it all the way down to pre-K because we used to only have half-day pre-K programs. Now we have full-day pre-K. We used to not offer tuition-based pre-K. Now anyone in our community can send their children to Cleburne ISD as pre-Kers. And we've made a commitment, the board has made a commitment to ensure that space is not the issue. But when we added full-day pre-K, where we used to have two classrooms, right, now we have one. Fast forward that, we've implemented some things on Fridays, obviously STEM programming, robotics, coding, trying to find some interest areas for these kids. And so I wanna thank you all who got to go through the tour and realize that a pre-engineering program in high school is a reality. These kids are doing amazing things. A partnership with John Deere and Holt Cat, a local company right here, is giving kids great exposure to small engines, diesel mechanics. Tie that into electronics, pneumatics, hydraulics, real skill sets that are needed, construction trades, just not in building but design. This was a fun one to design. It took a year and input from everybody who was a stakeholder. So that takes time. So we had two main functions that we wanted to start out and look at. Three years ago, what's the most efficient use of our facilities? Long term. Now, no one in here has a crystal ball. We did have a demographer come talk and say, hey, this is what our community is going to look like in 10 years. We're going to see slow, steady growth. And we all hope that's true. But bonds aren't always about growth. They can also be about equity. And when we talk about equity, sometimes I think that gets a little confusing. Equity doesn't mean exactly the same thing for every person. It means you give every person an opportunity to achieve the same thing, right? So somebody who's small and they want to see the baseball game from the outfield may need four boxes to be able to look over the fence. Somebody who's tall doesn't need any boxes because they can just lean on the fence right and watch the game. And somebody in between may need two boxes. That's equity. Each person's getting what they need to maximize the opportunity to be a great fan at a baseball game. So when we've talked about that, what does the long-term most efficient use of our facilities look like? And two, critically important, we need to be good stewards of our taxpayers' money. Our taxpayers need to know that if they support our school district, the things that we're doing support our kids and in turn supports our community because it will encourage growth, okay? Those were the two fundamental principles. How do we keep getting better? I don't think we're ever gonna arrive at a point where excellence is the most important thing but I do think our students are. Our students is who we serve. They're at the top of the pyramid. And so everything that we do decision-making wise as an administration is focused on what's best for our students and what our students need. 
And if we can get into the wants, let's get into the wants. And how do we do that? By improving our opportunities for academic success for every child. Every single child's important. And that may mean they need different things. Two, how do we create appropriate socialization? We've heard from our middle school people that sixth graders didn't really fit real well socially with eighth graders. We heard from our elementary people. Fifth graders didn't always fit really well now on elementary with pre-K. Pretty big discrepancy. So this is an opportunity to look at that. What makes sense for this community long term? Okay. Third, create a smoother transition. We know our kids have the most difficult transitional times between currently fifth grade and sixth grade. We also know the second most difficult time is between eighth grade and ninth grade. And you've already heard somebody reference that. We're bringing kids together who don't have relationships always, who always don't know each other, who come from different backgrounds that really create an enrichment for our community. I heard our president of the board speak today to Super SAC. And it really gave me a little bit of goosebumps because she said, hey, my youngest son went to A&M. That college experience, he felt prepared, that Cleburne had done a good job. And the fact that this community does celebrate its diversity, the fact that we can be different, the fact that we can learn to respect each other has helped prepare him for that next transition. Because at the end of the day, it's not about graduation. It's about preparing successful citizens for life. And that's a journey. It's not a stopping point, and it doesn't really have a starting point. Okay? And as a community school, we want to support our parents, and we want a smoother transition. And then four, we've tried to provide you data to show prior to the time that we were in this alignment, looking at performance, students did do better. That was kind of hard to argue. So when we saw that, we're saying we can continue to get better, but maybe we need to look at doing things differently in order to get better. And then finally, these were the four components that you all heard about from different stakeholders about the alignment piece. Number one is balance. Balance to me is means, it's not about just being a weedy or a Smithsonian, it's about being a yellow jacket. Because at the end of the day, we're all yellow jackets. That's our ultimate gift, is a flagship, one high school community that we can all come together. How do we do that and create balance? How do we ensure that the kids at one middle school have the same opportunities, not just programming, but opportunities as the other? Second, communication. We need to work more fluently with our schools in transitioning our kids. We heard about the rivalry. We know last week, candid conversation. Here at the high school, there were a lot of conflicts. Those conflicts were a lot of ninth graders. And a lot of those conflicts focused around which middle school did I attend. When we talked about it in here, it was talking about competition. The kids live it as an identity. Wheat does an amazing job with its kids. Tremendous staff. So does Smith. But they're not just Wheatons and Smithsonian's, they're what? What are they? They're all yellow jackets. They all got to come together. Okay? We talked about competition. We would love to have at least three competitive middle school teams. At least. Not to limit participation, but to increase competition. We all know you have to compete to what? to improve. 
Part of com competition is about driving yourself to be better, to be the best you you can be. Part of what we teach kids is that very thing. It's not about being the best. It's about being your best. It's about you maximizing the talents God's given you. If you asked me to stand up here and sing, this room would empty. That doesn't mean I don't have a great appreciation for people who have a beautiful what? Voice. Everybody has talent. And by getting kids together, we can enrich those talents. They come together earlier. We talked about opportunity. And so some of the discussions that you had were focused around that. So our challenge to you tonight as we move forward is to think about in that context. If we were to stay to two middle schools, is that the best thing for our kids? Does that really provide equity? Does that mean we really don't need to do anything? And you've already answered those questions. Because right now, we are two sixth, seventh, and eighth grade facilities. And they are different. And you were able to see that. Thank you, Michelle. And you had to get that nicety in there after showing our gray hairs and telling, calling us old. So it's all good. No, this is great. We appreciate y'all being here tonight. And, and thank you for allowing us to come into your home this evening and just share a little bit about what we've actually been working with some of your staff and the administration for, well, literally since uh, what the end of August, really. We've been in the district virtually every week, if not multiple times a week, ever since we got hired on and just trying to get to know you and to get to know your facilities. Before we really get into talking about some of the options, which I know even from the last meeting, everybody's kind of anxious to start getting into. Um, uh, go ahead and click. I think they would like me to just review a little bit of uh, the numbers and the capacities that we shared with you folks back a few meetings ago. Um, but, but the new updates from the demographics studies and everything, they've updated these uh, slides a little bit. Again, not really changing what we already saw, but this is going to be a few uh, better updated numbers. As you see at the very top, that's our current configuration as we have at all of the schools within the district. Shows you how much the peak enrollment, the functional capacity, the available, kind of gives you where we sit today. And as you can see there, Smith and, and Wheat Middle School are highlighted in yellow. Smith is already sitting at about 1225. If you recall, our target for what we were trying to achieve in this new grade, uh, grade realignment is about that 1250. So we're real close at Smith, already just using the existing capacity. At Wheat, that's sitting at 950. A little under the 1250 that we're trying to target for the, um, the grade realignment moving forward. You look down at the one on the bottom, your left, uh, you can see this is the proposed configuration with Smith and Wheat. That'll be the new peak enrollments. Smith sitting at about uh, 10, uh, 1037, Wheat at about 1042, very, very, uh, very much the same. But again, this is really where the two sizes of the existing schools really stand out for, to you. Smith sitting right there at a sweet spot, uh, but we having a little bit of uh, catching up to do if we, when we end up going that way. And then this is uh, over here on your far right, just kind of showing the delta in between the, the gain and loss in enrollment. Any questions about that? If you slip to the next one, similar information. I think all this is in their packet, is it not, Michelle? Okay, so you can see it a little bit better at your own leisure. This uh, is just really taking the same kind of information but breaking it down per grade as you see them moving, your cohorts moving from uh, pre-K all the way through 12 and kind of how that adjustment is moving forward. Any questions on that? So before you... You don't have to take questions, but we'll let Guthrie... Fair enough. Thank you, ma'am. So um, before we kind of start showing some of the pretty pictures, I do want to just... Uh, and. Uh, Miss Michelle did kind of steal uh, some of the thunder and she has been doing this a lot with us and so she knows our our routine very well uh, but we have literally been walking the, and canvassing the district at all the schools we had our civil engineers our structural engineers uh, mechanical electrical and plumbing we have a building envelope group that looked at your roofs and all the walls and windows our architectural staff we've walked all of the facilities from Adams to to, to the high school really we actually worked, did a little bit in here not much because a lot of it's fairly new but the performing arts we'll get into that next session and talk to you a little bit about some of that need um, but 
as you walk around, our, we captured a lot of needs, specifically at Wheat and Smith, knowing after um, the grade realignment, that was gonna be the focus where we needed to at least pay a, a, some, most of the attention to. We did find some things at the elementary school level, um, but as we look at some of those, a lot of those are life cycle replacement costs that, hey, you can't, you know, you can't really tell exactly when it's gonna break, and after talking with maintenance, uh, interviewing them extensively, talking about all the issues. We feel like at least a lot of the issues that are need to be planned for are being planned for at the elementary school. The things that aren't being planned for, we need to understand how the impact of this grade winning alignment is going to soften the, the capacity up there, allow you to, to use those buildings in a little bit different way, and really do a finer study on those next time around to really understand, because some of those buildings are a lot older. And for us to go in and start recommending putting stuff in and replacing AC units when we might be doing something different in the next three to five years, just didn't feel like that was good money put at those kind of situations, especially since the maintenance staff has done a great job over the last few years, really keeping up with all of those, even the older buildings. So. With that, I think I'd like to turn it over to Lee and let him at least review the first uh, couple options that we have for Smith. Um, I would like to reiterate again, not only do we have folks from the maintenance side and walking all your buildings, but I think at least once a week or twice a week for the last month and a half, we've been sitting down with Dr. Heath, uh, cabinet level folks, your curriculum folks, your principals. We had stakeholders of about 15 plus people in multiple meetings really trying to understand the program needs at Smith and Wheat in their new found configuration. Um, and unlike what Ms. Michelle mentioned, we generally don't get into a lot of design at this phase. We're at a high level, but you guys have an existing building and an existing uh, new need for that building. We really needed to do some high level design or deep dive in design just to understand what we could use, what we could carve out and what needed to be added to make that equity that Dr. Smith, or excuse me, Dr. Heath uh, um, mentioned earlier. So with that, know that there's been a lot of, there's a lot of detail behind the schematics that you're gonna see tonight. We wanted to start a little high with you folks. If you have other questions, we can drill down and understand a little bit more about what some of these components are, but we kind of wanted to start at a high level so that we could kind of walk you through the process and, and hopefully at the end of the day, kind of come up with a solution. So <clears throat> I know you guys have these printed out in, in front of you, so I, I was going to point a lot, but I don't know about y'all, but I don't like the laser pointer very much. And they have a super pet. Like Perfect. As well, okay. So I may do some pointing if it gets unclear for you. Um, why don't you do the pointer? So just want to walk through a little uh, briefly here. Um, we've got three three uh, slides you can see there in your in your packet that we want to show you tonight. Just starting with option A here, and this you know there's no order to what we're doing tonight. We're just trying to walk through some things that we've been talking about. I do want to reiterate what you just said though. These are not detailed detailed drawings these are trying to give us order of magnitude so we can know what needs to be done you know overall and assign dollar values to those but they were in-depth studies that we did that back these things up so there are sketches and drawings and things that we generated but that'd be probably 50 60 pages in your packet and that's we don't want to do that to you so we're we're flying a little high on that one of the things that um, I, there were some great comments that were made about how you feel about the school and I think some of the things that we're going to show you tonight and the things that you observe are going to be addressed here I know they will in fact um, let's just start with this so this is kind of a, an aerial view a site plan view uh, you can see in the brown area that's uh, well the whole box there that brown area specifically though is the existing footprint for Wheat Middle School as it sits today. Uh, the areas that you see in blue, those are additions where we're saying that we need to, we need to bring some additional space. You saw from the uh, capacity slides, the functional and the, both the, the maximum and the functional capacity that there needs to be some additions there to uh, um, make up for the growth that's gonna happen there. So uh, you, I'll just kind of start from the top of the page and work down. One of the interesting things that we've studied and you probably noticed when you went to the school was kind of getting, trying to bring update a front door, right? To really, like we've done on this, like it's been done on this campus, right? It's really strong. It represents your district, your community very well. 
So that's something that we're, we're trying to, to bring into this. We think that addition that has in administration, uh, classrooms, a media center, and according to the new codes, we'll have to have a storm shelter in there as well. So those components, but we worked into that blue box and you can see by the bus, I know that there's some traffic things that have happened in the past. This, this option would help to, to make up for those. The, the new entrance would be there off of Woodard Avenue. Uh, would allow for a great queuing area. You can see the long queue that it makes and it also gets uh, all the students being let out on the appropriate side of the car, right? So they wouldn't be crossing in front of cars when they need to get out, get out and... Yeah, go ahead. Yes. Yeah, you can see the edge of the high school over here on the on this half. So the stacking, when you come in this way, in the old days, you used to come here, but you'd stack all up and down Colonial and really back that up, especially when there was a lot of construction. So they moved the, the new entry, the, at least coming down here. But the problem is you got more queuing space, but now you're letting kids off on the wrong side of the car. So it's just kind of problematic. Yeah, one of our observations. So we address that in this in this option that we're showing to you. The bus loop and the staff parking kind of remain the same. There's a slight modification there because I'll point out the next item. We also know there'll be a greater number of, obviously there was a question about how will that uh, affect athletics. That's one of the things that was you probably noticed when you walk through the spaces is there's gonna need to be some need for increased locker room spaces. Uh, so that is what that addition is about. Uh, an athletic locker room area. And then the other one is the, the cafeteria is pretty undersized, um, if especially when you get to those 1,250 students, that's gonna be a big problem. I don't know about feeding kids, you know, starting at 10 o'clock. Districts do it all the time, right? It does happen. Uh, but our goal is to try to size that so that that doesn't happen. So that's part of the reason why in this plan we're saying, what if we, uh, pulled the stage out of that inside of the building and we made it an addition we could open up that whole space if you remember walking that plan stage was kind of locked interior we could open that up to the hallway and create some additional space so that's what the and there's some storage uh, components there that really need to happen chair storage table storage there's some maintenance things that need to be stored there and they're just as you walk when you remember when you walk through the building and someone even said storage was a, a pretty large uh, issue that you saw there because I get to talk about the greenbacks and the dollars and Michelle did a great job talking about how PBK has a, um, um, a history and a library of construction costs. We have thousands and thousands of, of construction projects. We have even more, 75% of our work is probably renovation projects. With that, it allows us to have a database of renovation costs and renovation costs are not a one number fits that renovation. We see different colors on the map. You see the blue and the, and the brown. Every one of those areas has a different value that we assign to it when we're starting to look at renovation costs. As, as example would be if you're doing an addition to your house and you're adding a kitchen and you're also building a garage. Well, you're gonna build that garage much cheaper cost per square foot than you will the kitchen because of the items that are within the kitchen. So with our database, we study individual unit costs. We're gonna look at new projects in a second also. That's an entire, entirely different database. The example of building a garage and a kitchen, if you were building a new house, all of that would be amortized together and it would be one construction cost. When we're doing renovations, we look at, Lee mentioned the stage. So the stage is a rather complicated area. It's a wide span. It's a big long span area. And it's also a smaller addition. We know that has a different unit cost than the renovation of the brown. One of the things that, that we're going to talk about also as we get further and further into designs is the renovation area for wheat and the brown also consists of making larger rooms so that we have smaller classrooms in in wheat than we than we really want that we would design for a new uh, a new uh, facility so typically you're around 750 square feet somewhere in there depending on the district some of those classrooms are 600 square feet or around the 600 square square foot area so when we show a renovation in the brown we're actually starting to move some walls and then we're building additional spaces in the blue Again, on the locker room side, so we have new locker room additions, a lot of plumbing, a lot of complicated things that go on in a locker room, and expensive components per square foot that aren't amortized over an entire new school. So when we build classrooms, they're much cheaper. So again, that's just our, how we analyze these. Lee talked about there are a lot of schemes and a lot of drawings that back up 
the, this, this scheme that you're looking at, and Todd talked about a lot of meetings, we also have pages and pages of Excel files that back up this cost. That's why you're seeing a range here. If we have to, on the fly, we can make pretty quick changes as this group decides to make changes to the, to the uh, concept of option A or option B or C or D, whatever becomes. But we can do that on the fly rather quickly because of our database. Michelle also mentioned inflation. One of the really, really important items when you're doing cost estimating and bond planning is looking for inflation. So there's a lot of conversation nowadays about the COVID cost and what has COVID done to construction costs. Well, COVID has caused construction costs to go down. We have bidders, what we call a bidders list when we have a project out. The bidders come in, they put their bids in for a project, whether it's renovation or new project. That bidders list is growing and growing with more and more subs and more and more general contractors. That drives the construction costs down. Now, the problem with that is even we've seen many, many uh, recessions, and I've seen two myself just since I've, believe it or not, I've been in the business for uh, 30 years. I'm, I'm the oldest one up here, believe it or not. And I don't brag about that actually. But, <laughs> but uh, so we've seen the recessions. Well, what happens is, when you come out of a recession, when we came out of the Great Recession, like we will come out of the COVID construction cost decreases now, there's an immediate correction that happens first, then you start hitting the gradual inflation. So the correction, if you're not ready for the correction, we've had schools back after the, the, what's referred to as the Great Recession with a $30 per square foot increase on a high school and then the inflation was on top of that. So if you're not prepared for that and you don't know or don't have the experience of estimating not only the individual unit cost that I mentioned, as well as tracking trends, which is COVID is a trend at this point, as far as construction costs, excuse me, um, and then also knowing what will happen when the subcontractors start getting busy again, they go away. That bidders list that I just referred to, it'll start going back down to two contractors, three contractors, the sub bids, two, two electrical sub bids, that drives costs back up rather quickly and sometimes almost overnight. So this scheme, and I don't know if Lee was finished describing everything in the scheme as far as the, the big blue block in the front, and we can go back to that in a second, but this scheme, we're we're estimating this scheme at 47 to $50 million, including the new construction of the blue areas and then also the renovation areas and then also some driveway and some other pavement areas. Yeah, this plan, option A, we're gonna show option B in a second, which is, which is uh, I don't wanna steal your thunder, but <laughs> brand new approach. But option A is basically when you walk in, it will look like a new facility. The exterior skin may not, except you're gonna, when you drive up on the blue side, the new main entry, which you haven't talked about yet, it will look, look new from that side. Yeah, I think that, that was the one thing. I, I did allude to it a little bit, but right now the way we've envisioned that, that piece is it gives a new front door to it. I said that earlier, right? Uh, but it also brings a media center into that. That's the one component that I wanted to talk about a little bit. You know now how, if you remember when you walk through Smith, the library area is up at the front, has lots of windows, it's open and inviting. We're trying to bring some equity there, right? Give those same kind of opportunities that uh, the library at, at Wheat, it's, it's a little more in the, it's centrally located. There's no, you don't get to see outside. There's no access to the outside. We think that in this, in this option that we're showing, that would bring some of that equity to this campus. Uh, so along with, uh, obviously, when the codes change, and they do uh, periodically, right, and, and municipalities update their building codes, I know when you did some of this, they were in a transition period, so they did not require you to do that. They have now brought that building code up to the current standards. Uh, and it basically, the way the code reads, it refers to a standard called the ICC 500. I'm going to say a word that you're going to go, I don't care, I'll forget about it later, and that's okay. But that, that refers us to the, wind, the, the area that we're in. It has a 250 mile an hour wind speed that could happen in a tornado, right, that triggers you to have for an e-occupancy, which obviously a school is an educational facility, that it is required to have a space and the way we read the code is and the way that you would want to that could house the campus inside that space. So that means the walls, the roof, the floor, everything has to survive and everything, anybody, everybody in by, inside is fine, right, in a 250 mile an hour wind. And so you can imagine the amount of, you know, how that dollar, right, it, the dollar value goes up. And that's where Rick did a good job of saying that's why we also know that that number is inside of what we're talking about too because that cost is different. One of the things that we, we want to make sure we do too is that the 
the the nice thing about this kind of concept would be is you could have i know you guys have lived through this you've lived through the renovations here and you saw how long it takes right to renovate and to phase it because you'd have to do a phased approach you're not going to go in and wipe out 140,000 right? yeah Just to give you an idea, I'm sorry, Lee, I no that's great so we know what that's like to go through that because as architects and doing as many as we know that that's sometimes just not in the cards, not something you want to look at. And so when anytime we say, okay, can we test fit another project on a site, which is all we're really doing here, you can I really don't want you to focus on the shape of the plan or anything like that because if if we chose to go in this direction, I can assure you it would look whatever the way that just the process you went through before, you'd have the same process again. It would be designed for Cleburne ISD. It wouldn't be something that, you know, we just throw down there and say, hey, this is what it's gonna be. But we had to pick something. So we picked one of our footprints that we've done before from our many designs that we've done, placed it on the site. One of the things that we noticed pretty quickly is that obviously if you kept wheat where it is, the logical place to put it on the site is on that lower portion of the site. If you remember how that site kind of falls down to that, to that corner down there. Right. And then, of course, bring all the other uh, things that we need to do, just like we're doing on the existing campus. Right. It, obviously, you get a, a brand new front door and all that, but you also get to place, you know, the the parent the parent drop off and pick up. We can talk about where that would be right over there off of Woodard in the intersection at, Har at uh, Harlan. You can come into that corner. You could still have access, as you can see on our drawing here, off of Woodard for our bus loop in the back, right, and some staff parking. Uh, this design actually has like a courtyard to it, and we saw that we've heard all the great things about the courtyard here, so that could be something that we could look at. But the, be the best thing to say about it is could it be done, and could you fit it on this site and still maintain the campus, right, and build this building? Absolutely, right? So. I guess the last thing I was going to wrap up on this is obviously then that once that building would be fully constructed, then you could get into the demolition of existing uh, Wheat Middle School, right? And then the practice fields could come on board. Well, uh, you know, we can we can work where we might change detentioning to and get all that resolved. We're getting the hurry up, John. We get in a hurry. We'll go. Yes, this will go fast. So Smith uh, Intermediate, I call it intermediate school because that's what it would become, right? In a grade realignment. Uh, I know there were some great comments that were made on that about the, you know, it was, it is in good shape, right? And the capacity is, it's not far off, but there are still some things that you noticed and you heard from the staff. I'll just hit quickly on a few of them. The biggest one is someone said something about the, that big open area, right? The food, the food area, right? That had the kitchen. So what can we do with that to convert that to a, to a space that could be something highly functional. It's right there off the main corridor. So we have some, we have, we're showing that area to be renovated. Uh, the special education, there are some things over there that need to be done to those spaces to make them more educationally appropriate for that. Uh, fine, there's some small fine arts things. I think the biggest one on this to point out is not on this floor, but also on the second floor. But let's just stay here first on this one. We'll talk about the cafeteria. That one you saw by the shape of that. It was a very irregular shape, has the sunken, you know, that lower floor. If you remember, there were description, and I'm sure all the tours got it, about how they have to basically queue out outside of the cafeteria and then come through. So that, similar to what we're doing at Wheat, we would add this stage to the outside. We'd go in there and that whole cafeteria would look like a new fresh start in there. It'd be a big open space, easily able to do the three periods that we talked about, right, to get to the 1250 capacity and not have to be out in hallways. And it's, it's pretty hard. We did, and I'll, I'll, I'll say what we said so everyone hears it. So the way the code reads so we're going to start with that because that's what we always refer to to tell us how we need to proceed and the way it reads is only when you add on additional space or you build new right so if i built that new building it obviously option b has to have for wheat would have to have a storm shelter in it the large addition where we're adding how many classrooms did we say about around 18 that's additional capacity therefore we have to build the shelter but if you quickly think about Smith and what we showed you, we're not doing e any of those things, right? So there's no capacity that we're generating that tells us. That doesn't mean that this group can't say we want to somehow, and I, we haven't even talked about that, right? But 
it would, but we'd also, it would, it would affect that dollar amount, right? That would affect what he starts looking at when he's talking about dollars, because as we just said, that's a, like a $200 a square foot on top of the construction cost for that space. We know, and, and that's a, a good illustration is, and I'm sorry I don't remember your name, but you, you brought up the thing about the, I think you were the one that said the, the food lab that's never used, right? Well, that's going to generate, that can be, a, those can be class, that could be a classroom, right? Those things can be converted to add more space inside that building. And there are opportunities for that because it's no longer going to be a middle school. It's going to be an intermediate school, sort of things that it would not have to have, right? There we go. Um, so uh, I'm Mike Wallace. I'm the executive director of technology for the district. And uh, we're going to, I'm going to make this as painless as possible, but we're going to talk a little bit about instructional technology, technology and safety and security is what I'll be going through. The first thing I wanted to touch on is uh, bond 2016 and where we've come uh, from then. And I think that'll give you some perspective in how, uh, uh, how far we can go and what all has been done to get where we're at today. So um, the state of technology prior to the 2016 bond uh, was pretty bad. Um, it was outdated. It was in uh, disrepair. There were, uh, it was failing. It was pretty tough. Uh, the teachers were having a, a rough time and there was uh, a real lack of buy-in of technology use in the classroom. And, you know, to be honest, I, I know exactly why I wouldn't do it either. You can't just keep doing things that don't work. If you have a pen and you're writing with it, but it runs out of ink, you don't just keep using it. You, you get a new pen. So just to give you an idea of uh, escalating costs uh, for maintenance and repair, just on projectors alone um, through on the in 2015 we spent around twenty two thousand dollars just to replace projectors and bulbs that were literally failing and those things were uh, the projectors themselves they this uh, they were very dim and so there were a lot of reasons to to uh, change those out they were also ceiling mounted which when a uh, an instructor gets in front of that in front of the board that casts shadows it's very difficult for the student to see actually what's going on. Our document cameras were in the same shape, five plus years old. Teacher laptops, it's really your engine for that classroom. You know, everything runs through that. Those were four to six years old across the district. So um, as I said before, the technology was just really unreliable. And uh, there are a couple of key components for teachers to get, you know, to get that buy-in from teachers to take on technology and change their teaching methods and, and do all those great things. Well, it, the first thing is the technology's got to be reliable. Otherwise, you're just spinning your wheels and you've got a room full of kids that you've got to do something with. Um, and you're trying to teach them, not troubleshoot technology. Um, so the key to teaching teachers adopting technology into their teaching methods is by providing them with a reliable experience every time and that there's a lot of studies to that but just my personal experience and and you can I'm sure each one of you would say the same thing if you had a had some tool something that you would use every time and it just didn't work why, why would you keep using it so but we we passed, uh, the community passed the bond. And so, it, you know, just to take you into that a little bit, I was very excited. I like to help teachers succeed in teaching kids. That's why I got into this business. Um, so we had 480, right now we have 480 teachers. We replaced all their laptops. They had port replicators that connects all the devices in the classroom to the laptop. Document cameras, those are used to project uh, printed material through the projector. They had classroom speakers when we were done so that anything that was projected on the screen and there's audio, it's not just coming through the teacher's computer, it was coming through speakers where they could hear it equally throughout the room. And probably the, mo uh, the key component to this new, this new design was our interactive projectors. They gave teachers the ability to work 
from the board and control their laptops without having to go back and forth and uh, keep a more seamless experience with uh, with their with the learning process in their classrooms. Uh, during that, we also deployed and purchased uh, computers, or actually they weren't computers; they were Chromebooks for all the students in the district. Uh, that was uh, that's a huge deal because. You have teachers, or not teachers, you have students in this district, we have a high percentage of uh, free and reduced numbers. That means we have a high number of economically disadvantaged kids in this district. That means, you know, if you, it relates right to technology in their home that they can use to do assignments, that they can use to, to uh, just really work on and have the same experience, learning experience the other kids have. And so what we did was they all had a, they're all, all on an equal playing field after we gave them Chromebooks. We, pro, we didn't provide them internet, but we posted and publicized low interest, I mean not interest, low income options for internet. And so they could go through companies like AT&T and if you qualify, there are very affordable options. And I think as a result of that, we have a lot of families on, uh, that have internet that, that wouldn't have had it. So we'll jump down to keys to success. Uh, and this, these are real keys into, into, for one, just technology being used, but it being effective. And, and the first thing was the teachers were trained uh, how to use these things. They had professional development that you, uh, taught them how to integrate that technology into their teaching methods. And that's a, that's a huge thing. And that was right from the beginning. Uh, more importantly, though, ongoing training. That's the key right there is ongoing training. And it was done, and it's done annually all throughout the year. They're learning opportunities. And teachers continue to grow and build on their, their knowledge as, as we go. One of the great things I thought that was really a, a cool idea, they brought in what's called micro-credentialing, and that is um, where you take small bite-sized chunks of information that, uh, that you know the district sees as important, and you give that to them, and then they get, uh, uh, they, when they master those levels, they, they get badges, and when they prove that they know the information and have the skills, and so that way it creates a little competition in the professional development. It's a great way to, to, uh, to promote learning. They also have the opportunity to take learning pathways where they can uh, learn about things and how to do things that they really like to do and really have interest in. So it's, it's a great program. Uh, the next key to, to success is a technology refresh cycle. So Bond 2016, Everything is up and running, running great. Uh, maintenance costs are low. Teachers have reliable technology that they're using in the classrooms. And we've got to maintain that with a refresh cycle. And that means we have to purchase new equipment based on a particular, you know, based on that technology's life cycle. So when it's predicted to go to be non usable. So, what we like to do is for teachers to have. The, the best technology in the district. And then we move that technology when we do the refresh and we repurpose it to other uses in the district. So that way the teacher's room is always the focus on, on being up and running. And that's also our, in technology, that's our, that's our you know, key indicator. If someone's down, uh, or that's our you know, top priority. If a teacher's down, they drop everything. It doesn't matter if, it, if they're doing something for me or whoever, it doesn't matter. And they go help that teacher because that's what we're all here for. So those are our keys to success. And um, I will say that our instructional technology team did a, an amazing job with the, the professional development throughout the years and our curriculum uh, instruction have, they've, they all work, we all work together uh, to make the, all of these great things happen. So we have um, empowered teachers, we have empowered students with the technology, and you marry that up with a uh, learning management system. Many of you are probably familiar with Blackboard or, or Canvas. 
they're they're two of the the largest in the in the world and uh, we use canvas but what that does is it creates a kind of a learning environment that it brings together students and teachers and that way that uh, the students can ask questions a lot of times students won't ask questions in class they don't want to raise their hand uh, that gives them the opportunity to ask a question of the teacher and then for them to respond the teachers can also they create and present their online um, online uh, lectures through that as well they can um, create tests they can deliver those tests deliver the quizzes and have those graded automatically and so the students can take all of that through this learning management system and it also enables students to collaborate through uh, project-based um, you know project uh, or collaborate collaborate on projects so it's it's really a it's a great thing for the students it serves so many different purposes so we have this learning ecosphere we'll, I'll call it and and it works really well and the teachers have worked incredibly hard to get to where we are today because it, you think about what we've done and what we've asked them to do think about the job that you do today and your boss comes up to you and says, uh, you're doing an awesome job, but you know, I want you to do every bit of it differently. And that's really what we asked them to do uh, four years ago. And I, I get that. It is incredibly tough and they deserve a major, you know, kudos for all the, the extra work that they had to do all those evenings and trying to learn all these new things. It's tough. It's not easy. It's easy to say. It's easy for me to say, but they lived it and they did it. So now we are now we're up to so you know all these great things that we've done and then COVID comes along and um, that presented another hurdle for us. So how do we how do how do we educate kids? Uh, that's you know what we were thinking at the time and um, we were really in a great position though with this problem. We had already um, distributed to our middle school and high school students Chromebooks that they took home regularly. We had um, one-to-one -one elementary Chromebooks. Those were not take home, but they, we had them in carts. So what we did was we, we broke all those carts down and then volunteers from all across the district came out. We took them over to Cook Elementary and we uh, distributed those to to students and it was over a three-day period people volunteering their time they're not being paid to be out there and no one told them to come um, so that that was that was i was just I don't, in awe of it i was uh, you know because we didn't really know in, in technology we don't have a large group and so i was just in awe of the dedication our teachers and administrators have to the education of our kids. It's that right there, they had skin in the game. They weren't getting, no one's getting paid to do that. So I was just very impressed. I had a couple of questions I just threw up there because this, that is the, that's where most districts in the country were. So what if we hadn't had the 2016 bond, if it hadn't passed, uh, how would we have given those students Chromebooks? How would teachers have conducted class on 10-year-old computers delivering remote instruction? Um, the, you know, how, how, do, how would we have educated kids? The only thing I can really think of is we would have just probably done paper and pencil. You know, we would have sent packets home and, and because that's all we could do. And that's actually what a lot of districts did do, that they didn't really have another choice. We had some unexpected benefits too. Um, from the bond and and I, I kind of went into some of those but uh, that ongoing professional development that we've had all this time it prepared our teachers for the remote learning systems it um, they had already integrated all that and what was needed to teach remotely into their a lot of their training processes I know it was super tough it was a it was not easy and no one was really looking forward to doing it because it's the unexpected but they did an amazing job once they got started teaching kids remotely and on with zero time in preparation to be able to do that 
uh, but the va- the bond that that's another benefit of the bond. The bond uh, provided everything that we needed to combat uh, COVID and um, and and have so far. So I'm going to get to our first priority. There's two priorities in the um, in technology. The first one um, is the top priority for everyone, really, and that's to provide a safe and uh, secure environment for our staff and students. And so the first thing we're going to talk about are video surveillance system that we currently use. It's very it's outdated. The the manufacturer no longer supports it. The video quality is very poor. It's um, and any of the administrators or anyone who's ever tried to use that video, it's very different, very difficult to try to use. Uh, so we developed a new district standard of cameras and a system uh, so that we could combat that as well. You know, we um, we spent quite a bit of time and a lot of people were involved in other departments to come up with that system and the cameras. And uh, so far, the high school, Wheat, Smith, Cook, Coleman, have a new system and cameras. What remains are the campuses, uh, Adams, Gerard, Irving, Marty, and Santa Fe, as well as the support campuses need uh, the new system. This is our first, um, first of two in safety and security. The next thing is our phone system. The phone system, uh, just to give you an idea of what, uh, we operate our own phone system internally. It's similar to, you know, if you grew up in the time where you had a phone in your house that was actually wired into the wall and it rang and all. We have, we we operate a a similar phone system. It's much more advanced than that, but uh, it's very similar to that. It's been in use since 2013, and the manufacturer is no longer going to um, provide any support at the end of 2021. So we're going to have to we have to do something. Uh, safety and security and phones are just they go hand in hand. There's really you can't do one without the other. In between. Um, 2016 and um, oh, well, let's just say over the last four years, we've deployed classroom telephones to all classrooms. And what that looks like today in the classroom, teachers can call uh, parents, they can call interdistrict, they can call 911. And to give you an idea of a 911 call, they, they call 911, the operator answers, and it gives them the building address, not any other information. And no one, no one on campus is notified that there is an emergency. So newer systems, they all incorporate, so they, they combat these the holes that we have in this system. They provide the room number that the call was made from. They provide that same address. They also notify the campus staff that there's something going on, and it gives the administrators time to t- maybe take some proactive actions at that point to combat or help out whatever that emergency might be and so we need to migrate to a new uh new system that complies with federal and state laws and to to have a better and safer environment for our um, safety and security Um, we'll move on to priority two which is our instructional I've called it all really all instructional technology because everything all the in technology supports instruction Uh, the classroom instructional technology is probably what we all really think about as instructional technology but um, and and that's what I'll cover mostly but uh, when I get to the the other kind of the back end stuff you'll I'll point that out So in a classroom, everything is, uh, you know, and with that learning management system, everything is available 24 seven. Some of the benefits of of this system and all the things that the teachers have done is it builds a student's uh, 21st century skills. And there's a long list of those skills that they need to, they need to develop and they need to learn but some of those are critical thinking, collaboration, leadership skills. All these systems have a, have a major role in that. 
and you think about student engagement in the classroom. I remember when I was in school and we had the chalkboards and all this was very, not, not very engaging at all. Um, I had an experience when I went back to school in 2000. And so I had this huge difference in the education, my, my education. So I went from black blackboards to at the time they had PowerPoint presentations and the, the quickness the, and the ease at which I learned the information was mind-blowing compared to what I had been used to. And I recognized it at that point in time because there was a dramatic difference. So the students are engaged more. They're more motivated, and it does accelerate learning. Technology has, has helped teachers uh, by pulling into, you know, moving everyone into this new model of connected teaching. And what that really means is you have the, the teacher, the student, and then you have all the professional uh, materials that they have availability to and the resources that are, that are out there. The district subscribes to a lot of services that provides these uh, prof this professional content and uh, to the teachers. They don't just have to go out and find it all and the resources. We subscribe to a lot of things that provide those resources. So we'll go to the classroom now. Um, Wheat Middle School, they touched on this a little bit, but I'll, I'll touch on this just a, a, a tad here. So Wheat Middle School, they're gonna have all of the technology, the classroom technology and uh, network and all that, wireless, all in their propose, in, in those numbers that you just saw. But some, what that does include is We've, we're moving to a new model of, uh, you know, as technology evolves and prices have dropped, we've moved from ceiling mounted speaker or ceiling mounted projectors to short throw projectors that, that are interactive. And now uh, the next move is to interactive uh, monitors that are on the wall that are 4K. They're very comparable to the same uh, short throw projectors that we have today. And what you get with that though is dramatic difference in clarity with 4K. Uh, even though it, it is a little bit smaller, our short throws uh, put out an image that's about 100 inches diagonally, but just the quality and difference and the brightness, uh, it, the viewability from, by the student is dramatically different. And then we have the document cameras, port replicators, physical wired wireless networks, and all of those things that are currently at Wheat. If you choose to do something at Wheat, then all of that technology will be reused throughout the district. It'll be moved into inventory, our inventory, and then as things fail or need to be replaced, they will come out of that inventory. So those tax dollars will continue to be used until the uh, until it needs to, until it hits that refresh mark. What is included in the technology proposition is, um, are all the classrooms in the district that, um, so that'd be all the elementaries and Smith uh, Middle School. Those, that technology by 2023 is gonna be seven to nine years old, which is, is getting, it's pretty old at that point. Uh, so we'll move to the same model of, of the new interactive monitors at that point in time because that's our new district standard. Speakers that we've rolled out into all the classrooms, we'll reuse those, but everything else would be, would be replaced. Speakers just have a different life cycle, as, as we all know. Laptops will also be replaced throughout the district at all the instructional campuses, and the CTE labs will be refreshed. I know we just rolled those out and they seem new, but uh, CTE has some very high-end high requirements on, you, know, you just think about CAD are one of the, uh, one of the things that they study in the engineering and the the um, specifications for those computers, we always keep the newest, mo uh, the newest version of those programs every year we update, and every year those specifications become a little heavier. So it puts more workload on those laptops, and then eventually the laptops, or not, not laptops, we'd probably, we would put workstations in those, but 
the workstations become um, where they're out of spec for those particular uses. And so at that point, we would need to replace those. And here we are with our core technology systems. I'll just go through this briefly. Um, you, can, you can read that, but I'll tell you what the, the network operations center or the network operations, that provides internet access to all the campuses. Our uh, UPS system, uh, it's just like a U small UPS you'd have at home hooked up to your laptop or computer. Um, it you know, covers minor blips in our uh, network operations center. Generator, anything that's not minor, it would continue uh, to power and keep everything up. And that, what that does is it protects the data that we have in the environment and the equipment as well. Uh, the equipment does, for some reason, the, uh, the equipment does not like to just be unplugged. And it, it, there's always problems when you try to bring it back up and, and you're lucky sometimes if it all works. So the generator would keep, uh, keep everything up and running for a, an extended period of time if we had a power outage or a storm as we have. It, the core technology systems also cover the wired and wireless campuses which is all of our, you know, how you get on the internet and if, you know, if you see our networks on your phone. So here's really where the rubber meets the road. Why is all of that stuff important? Well, first thing is we have to keep everybody safe and secure in, in the school. Staff and students, we've, that's our first priority right there. We've got to keep everyone safe and secure. When we jump down to technology, as I said before, it's just gotta be reliable or people won't use it. And in this world today, they have to use it or the, our students are gonna fall behind very fast. The teachers have also uh, worked extremely hard to adopt the technology and to change all the things that they do. And, they, and that's, that's a key right there to, to keeping movement forward and not falling behind. Our student, and you know, just some things I was thinking about. I mean, our students deserve to be empowered. They deserve to be able to have the, as good an education, the best education possible, and be prepared. Like the CTE programs here are going to prepare them for jobs if they don't choose, or if they don't choose to go to college, then they're going to be prepared for a job. But if they do choose to go to college, they're going to have a skill that they can pay for college. So there's a lot of there's a great things there. It's also going to give them the tools to be successful in their jobs, and it's going to give them a, com a competitive advantage in the workplace. So the funding is necessary, and the reason it's necessary is if, it, if we don't have the funding, then our district budget doesn't support the replacement of technology as we have, as we have it. And we go quickly back into a pre-bond 2016 state. And we're in a maintenance mode and trying to do the best we can to keep everything running. And that's, that. I really don't want to go there. And I don't think any, no teacher really wants to go there for sure. And our students deserve better. So here are the costs of priority one. Safety and security is 900,000 to replace those two systems. The uh, priority two is all the everything, all the technology behind the classroom technology, and it supports that. Six point five million. That touches every, every all of our campuses, and um, and the total is seven point four million. <laughs> 